Hi, everybody. This is Nicole from Design Lab. I manage career services and partnerships. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for our Finding the Right UX Environment um, webinar. With me, I have Ben Judy, who is a design lead um, based down in Texas at the moment. Um, if you'd like to type into the chat like who you are, where you're joining from, feel free. Throughout this presentation, I will be monitoring the questions tab. So if you do have questions, put them over there. And we'll be pausing and kind of uh, stopping in between so you can ask questions and, and we can make this sort of as interactive as possible um, a webinar can be. Um, so I will not take any more time and turn it over to Ben. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, everybody. Ben Judy here. So good to see all of you. Hi to my friend Lily. I see you in there, Lily. I see all the people saying hello in the chat. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, I want to talk about helping you find the right environment for you to work in as a UX designer or product designer or UI designer or whatever you want to call yourself, right? Uh, finding your best fit. And, and when I started out in, in this career field years ago, um, it, it was not clear to me. It was kind of like this picture. Um, where there's this signpost, I could go this way, I could go that way, I see a few options in front of me, but then there's this landscape, this great unknown with, with many interesting features and trailways, and, but it's foggy, it's cloudy, I, I can't make out what's out there. And so uh, what I needed back then um, that I didn't necessarily have was someone who could sort of lift the fog and sort of show me some of the landscape and talk with me about what might be around this corner or that corner. Uh, and I'd like to do some of that for you um, in the next 45 minutes, which is going to be real tough to, <laughs> to cover that landscape. But here we go. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through as much as we can. So let's, let's play Mad Libs. You guys know what Mad Libs are. Uh, it's those funny little stories with blanks you fill in, the nouns, the verbs, the adjectives, and then you read it back and it's just crazy because you put random words in there. Um, we can sort of do that with our careers in UX, right? So I work as a blank, put in you know role, title, or skill set in an industry or market sector and in a certain type of organization. So it might look like this, right? I work as a UI designer at a digital marketing agency. Or I might be a senior interaction designer at a travel software company that happens to be a for-profit corporation. Uh, or I could be an information architect, a little bit of an old school job title now, but they're still out there, I think, uh, at a social video startup. That's a very different kind of organization than the others listed here, right? Uh, I work as a UX lead at a consulting firm, and my clients are mostly government clients. I'm kind of in that industry space or market sector, if you will, and on and on I could go. Again, at the beginning of my career, I didn't know what all of these possibilities were. I just knew kind of that I liked to design things and I had developed a little bit of skill and I had some passion, uh, but I didn't know where I could end up. And by the way, these are all um, jobs that I actually have had in my career and I could have added many more, but these are environments that I've been in. So that's, that's kind of what I mean when I say, finding your best fit in a particular environment as a UX designer. So as you're out there interviewing and you, know, you either walk into the company, they greet you and they take you into the interview room or now more commonly, you're probably doing it over Zoom or Google Meet or what have you, uh, you've got all these questions that, that maybe you're asking, but maybe not, right? Um, because you either don't have the opportunity or it's just that initial screening interview, but you're wondering, what is it like to work here? You know, is this conversation even worth it? <laughs> is, is this employer a really good fit for me? Or am I just going to be really frustrated a few months into this job because I would have been happier somewhere else? Um, and what questions should I ask during the interview anyway? Right? Is that even appropriate? Um, what, and and how, do I, how can I ask the right questions to determine if this is a good fit for me, if this environment is the right place? So again, that's what I want to talk about today. You know, which way do I go and what's out there and how can I start to think about that? So when uh, we think about different environments for UX people to work in, Here's how I kind of broke it down. The information architect in me kicked in and I had to sort of give some hierarchy and some structure and, and some labels to things. And I think there's three big buckets, right? The organization that you're working for. What type of organization is it? What industry is it in? 
you know, culture, values, ethics, brand recognition, all those sorts of things. Then there's this kind of smaller set of concerns within that organization, which is what is the UX team or UX discipline or UX practice? What does that look like within that company? If you're just a UX team of one, <laughs> maybe you work for a small company, a startup, and you're the only designer, the only researcher, you are the practice, you are the discipline. But if you're working alongside other UX practitioners, what is the level of maturity of that team? What, how is that team structured? What is the size of that team? Um, what does the UX leadership look like? Um, how do you learn from others and grow in your career within that UX discipline? And then the third category of concerns is you. And this is going to be the most individualized thing, the most unique thing. Um, but what are your skills? Um, what are your natural talents? And what are the things that really get you excited, right? What are your passions? So this is the landscape in terms of just broad categories of things that we can we can dig into today. So here's what I want to do. I want to start going down this list. I'll talk for a few minutes about types of organizations that hire UX people. And I'll talk for a little bit about different industries and market sectors that you can work in and share a little bit of my experience. And then I'm going to pause and come back to this menu. And, and one of two things can happen. Um, you guys can guide the conversation here and tell me, hey, this is the topic I'm most interested in, right? Nicole's going to help me keep an eye on the chat. And, and you can ask questions or you can just say, hey, I want to talk about UX maturity or I want to talk about you know, discovering what I'm really passionate about, what, whatever is on this menu. And I'll kind of jump to that topic because we're going to run out of time to go through all of these things, <laughs> right? Um, if I don't hear anything from you, then I'll just keep going through and it'll be more boring. But, but let's get started. So let's talk about the type of organization that you might work in. And this is not comprehensive, but I think this covers a fair amount of the landscape. Um, I will say, Ben, go ahead. before we start, I think that your um I think that your notification sound is on because when they put the yes. people in the chat, how do I turn that on? Because I think down I'm under on the right hand corner of the screen, there's like a little bell. And if you hit that, I, got it. Okay. Turn it I think it's you because I, I think I was on Yeah, there. it's me. Turn that. That. Yeah, you know, I, I turned off uh uh, put, put my Mac on Do Not Disturb. But yes. Do it for live story. Okay. We're, we're I think good. we're good now. Okay. Go Thanks. for it. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. So types of organizations, right? For-profit companies may be the first thing that comes to mind, possibly, when you think about going to work somewhere as a UX designer. So what can be good about working for a for-profit company versus the other things on this list? Um, a successful company might have a lot of money, <laughs> right? Just to be really blunt a really successful for-profit company might have the resources to, to provide to a UX team or to a UX designer uh, that some of these other organizations might not at times. Of course, your mileage will vary. Of course, there's a spectrum and, and economy goes up and down and all that sort of thing. But I know from my own experience, when I've been in large companies that had a lot of money and were willing to invest in UX, it was good times in terms of being able to get resources, software, funding for things like research, um, you know, all those expensive things that it, that it can take to really do UX at a high level, the resourcing can be there. On the other hand, sometimes in a for-profit company, because profit, the bottom line is the thing that leadership is most focused on, sometimes that can run counter to what is best for users. And there's sometimes that tension between, hey, this would serve users well, but these are the organizational goals and strategy. Um, what might go either way is, depending on the situation, you might end up working on the same product for a long time. You might like that or you might not. But a quick example from my own career experience, when I worked for a travel software company, uh, some of their software, the legacy software that they had was 10, 15, 18 years old and was just in maintenance mode. They were making a ton of money off that software but there wasn't a whole lot to do as a UX designer. But if you were assigned to that product group and you were kind of stuck on that for years and years, you know, it, it sometimes felt boring and felt hard to keep your skills up. That's situational. But those are some of the things to look for in a for-profit company. Someone's asking in the chat, where's the list that's being referred to? You can see my screen, right? You can't no, see my screen. Right so that's because I need to share it. <laughs> that's my bad. Okay, how about that? <laughs> Sorry about that. Here yeah, this go. is the list of different types of organizations. 
Okay. Um, so for-profit companies, nonprofit organizations, on the other hand, kind of a whole whole different deal, right? What's great about working as a UX designer in a nonprofit is you get to change the world in a way that might align to your personal values. You get a sense that the work you're doing is meaningful beyond dollars and cents, right? Depending on the mission of the organization, you might really love putting your UX skills to work in that kind of environment. On the other hand, nonprofits typically rely on donations. They have meager budgets. Every penny is pinched and every dollar counts. And back to that discussion about resources, you know, that a lot of nonprofits can't even afford to hire UX people, or if they do, they maybe can't resource them the way a for-profit organization could. Um, nonprofits need all kinds of help though too, right? So the generalist role is much more common there. A UX designer might be asked to help with marketing, branding, content development, just about anything else in a nonprofit. Um, and that could be good. If you like that, that might not be what you want. So something to think about. I'm going to go a little faster now just to get through this list so we can move on to other topics too. But, you know, when we think about startups, it's high risk, high reward, right? You could gain a lot of influence in a startup. If you get in early, you're one of the first few employees. And if you have a strategic mind, you aren't just interested in designing great user experiences, but you want to affect the organization and have a voice in product strategy and company strategy. You might be able to do that in a startup much more easily than a, a older, more established and larger organization. On the other hand, uh, startups crash and burn all the time. <laughs> in fact, most of them do. And uh, that can be an interesting experience, if not a very fun experience, uh, to be a part of a ship that's going down. And so it's that high risk, high reward. Um, small teams, fast paced, kind of a hustle or die environment is usually what you find in a startup. And that may or may not support what you want to grow your UX skills. So that's something to think about. Uh, client services, I'm talking about agencies and consulting firms. Right now I work for a consulting firm. So I would say I'm in this category. Um, this can be a great place to build your portfolio and your experience as a UX designer. I often tell design lab uh, career services people who have just finished the academy, you know, look at those agencies and those consulting firms. If, if your goal is to go out there and in the next three years, build a strong portfolio of, of real work that you've done um, and get a lot of experience on different kinds of projects with different clients in different industries, an agency could be, or, or a consulting firm could be the place to go. Um, on the other hand, um, agencies in particular sometimes have a, an, an earned reputation for you know, long work days and 40, 50, 60, 70 hour work weeks and burnout can be really high. Your mileage will vary. Some organizations are better than others with that. Um, also clients might be controlling or unpredictable. You have to make the client happy and you don't necessarily face that when you're working in house. Uh, so those are some things to consider. And um, an uneven workload maybe, right? It could be driven by the peaks and valleys in client contracts. There, there could be some lean times and then and then times when you have more work than you can handle. And so that's client services. Government, um, a whole other realm. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily think about being a UX designer in government, but there are jobs. I saw some job postings this morning uh, from the US federal government um, in, in the Defense Digital Service. And, and there's lots of other corners and pockets of government that are hiring UX designers. Um, what's really interesting and exciting about that is that, um, again, you get to um, do work that might align with your values in the sense that you're working for people. You're, you're working on things that will impact people's lives directly. Um, if you're creating you know, digital channels, websites, services that have to do with public benefits. Um, man, I know some really passionate UX designers in government that love that space because they know they're really making an impact on people's lives. Um, I had the opportunity just last year to work on the US web design system, which was really cool. So this is the design system that is used by federal government websites. Um, millions and millions of users annually and you know just that sense that you're serving the public um, and so that's an exciting place to be government if you're directly employed by the government um, sometimes salaries aren't quite on par with with you know the for-profit world um, so that's one thing to look out for 
And then, of course, uh, well, academic institutions, I, I should mention too. I have a good friend who, who teaches at a university, um, but he also does web design for the university. Um, and so there are those jobs out there too. Um, independent consultant or freelancer is kind of the wild card here, right? Um, all of us who build this skill set in UX can always choose to go this direction if we want to, right? Go find clients of our own. Um, there, of course, you are running the business and not just doing the work. And so it sort of becomes two jobs. Right? You've got to find your clients, manage your client relationships, billing, you know, invoicing and billing and all of that stuff you have to do or figure out how to get it done in addition to um, actually doing the work. So that's kind of a rundown of different types of organizations you could work for. Hopefully this um, makes you think of something you hadn't thought of before as a place to look for UX jobs. I'm gonna to jump to the next topic real quick um, and cover that. And then uh, we'll maybe take a peek at the chat and see if anybody wants to jump to another topic. I'll go back to the list. So let's look at different industry or market sectors, right? Um, what do I mean by this? Uh, computer hardware and software would be an industry. Financial services, your, your banks, your insurance companies. Retail, right? Uh, certainly e-commerce, uh, Amazons of the world, as well as you know, Walmart, Target, et cetera, and, uh, and grocery stores, that sort of thing. Healthcare, travel, real estate, telecommunications, different market sectors. What is it like to work um, in those places as a UX designer? How is it different? I think there's three sort of categories of things. Your experience within the industry, how much does that matter? Do you need to build industry experience? The second thing is UX maturity of those industries themselves and then different constraints. So let me summarize uh, a few points here real quick. A question I often hear um, from students in Design Lab is, do I need to have industry experience before I'm qualified to work somewhere? You see a job posting for um, a big retailer, but you have no experience working inside a retail business, right? Or you see a job posting from a bank. Oh, I've never worked in financial services. Does that matter? What I generally tell people is, it's a plus if you do have that experience. And if you have that in your background, certainly bring it up in the interview, certainly highlight it, right? No one's going to uh, you know, discount experience that you have that you could bring to the table. On the other hand, it's probably not gonna hurt you much that you don't. You don't need to worry about it. Um, I've worked in a lot of different industries. You, know, you saw a few of them, um, travel, I've worked in healthcare, I've worked in commercial real estate, I'm now serving government clients and Seldom, if ever, in my career has anyone made an issue of the fact that I didn't have a lot of deep experience in that industry. Your skills as a UX designer and researcher is what they hire you for. Um, and you're expected to learn and you will learn on the job about that industry. So I just wanted to answer that question. Uh, UX maturity. So this is going to be something that is measured best at the level of the organization itself. Each company will have its own UX maturity level. But you know, there have been some studies looking at things at an industry level. So InVision, who you're probably familiar with, um, published uh, a report a few years ago they called the New Design Frontier. And, uh, and I thought this was interesting. They found industries that have fewer low maturity companies. So in other words, high maturity, relatively high maturity of UX include healthcare, pharma, IT, advertising, transportation, and automotive. Uh, now, you'll certainly find exceptions where there are some low UX maturity advertising companies, for example. But broadly speaking, as they study those industries, this is what they found. And then industries with the most room for improvement include education, nonprofit and research and development. They called those industries, I would say those are types of organizations or functions, tomato, tomato, but retail, consumer durables, and surprisingly banking, they said, um, had a lot of room for improvement with UX maturity. And that last one gives me pause. I think banking is an interesting one because um, you'll find exceptions to that, right? I think there are some big notable exceptions in the banking industry. Um, a, a few companies that come to mind include Capital One and USAA and Chase who have huge UX teams who make a big investment in user experience. Um, but I think there's a long tail of many, many, many large and mid-size and small banks that just don't invest in UX at all. and so. That's what they saw. And then finally, constraints. And I think this is gonna be the most practical thing to think about 
when you look at working in this industry versus that industry as a UX designer, there are different constraints on design. My friend Mike Tinglin, uh, who I've worked with in the past, uh, great UX designer and manager, uh, he gave me this quote when I talked to him about this. He said, there's different constraints on design, what you can or can't do, not based on what's best for the user, which is how we would normally like to operate <laughs> as UX designers, but based on legal compliance and business model constraints. Um, and so if you're working in healthcare, for example, there are going to be policies and, and laws and regulations around um, privacy of information uh, for patients where, that are going to constrain what you can do with product design or with UX design. Uh, if you work in the financial services industry, you know, the Security Exchange Commission and, and this and that government agency are going to be all up in the business <laughs> telling them what they can and can't do. And it's going to affect the words you can use in your designs, in your content, uh, even the way that you present things and the way you craft experiences. So knowing some of those constraints about different industries, maybe that will or won't affect your, your job search or your willingness to take a job, but it's something to have your eyes open to going into an industry. I, I have heard a lot of designers who work in financial services complain about the amount of time it can take to, to get things to go live because they have to go through so many different compliance checks and the lawyers have to look at everything and, and so forth. Okay, so we've covered a couple of different aspects of this landscape, types of organizations, industry or market sector. I apologize for not having my screen shared earlier. This is the menu of different UX environments, different aspects of the organization you could work for, different aspects of the UX discipline within that organization, and then things about you. Um, I'll pause here for a second, and if any questions have been asked in the chat, I'd be happy to take those. Or if someone just wants to be brave and raise their hand and say, I want to talk about this topic next, we can jump to that one. Ben, thank you for, for getting this started here. And I've been kind of monitoring the, the questions over here. And there's a couple questions around, as a junior UX UI designer, what can I do to make my portfolio stand out? Um, what do I need to include? What, pro what types of projects do I put in there? Um, so I'd love, you know, I think, I think your thoughts on, again, broadly, and I think we heard from this discussion, it is truly going to depend on what industry you're applying to, what the role is, how that industry, how that company may value, you know, UX design, but any tips or tricks on what everybody here could do to sort of get in the door, um, you know, in different types of these companies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, what you want in your portfolio is your best work, best examples of the kind of work you want to get more of, <laughs> right? So if you want to do, you know, UI design, mobile UI design, let's say, then you want that to leap off the page when someone comes and looks at your portfolio. Um, and, you know, re really bring it into this context or this lens of what kind of environment do I want to work in? You know, back to that um, discussion about industry and market sector, if you've done anything even tangentially related to the industry of a, a job that you're applying for, you want to highlight that, right? And I know one of the things that we do in, in career services in Design Lab is we help we help people kind of create a customized or, or specially kind of tweaked uh, a case study or portfolio for a specific job posting. So let me give you an example. If you apply to a retail company. Um, let's say it's Walmart, just to pick an example. I've never worked for Walmart, but they're a big brand name, right? What have you done in the past that could convince them that you know something about how to sell things <laughs> or about how to help people um, find the products they want, put it in their cart and check out, right? You want to um, have that be the first thing that they see when they look at your, at your portfolio. Um, I think maybe possibly what's behind this question too is what if I'm someone who doesn't have a lot of stuff to put in my portfolio? I'm new to UX. I want my first UX job, but I don't have anything to put in there. Well, one, I would say go through Design Lab Academy because <laughs> you will have things to put in your portfolio. But two, I would say um, you, what you want to do with that kind of portfolio is show how you have learned and how you are learning and what you are learning. You don't necessarily need to fake it and make it look like you've designed all sorts of things you haven't designed. Don't feel any pressure to do that. Show, visualize, and talk about 
a, a course you've been through, a book you've read, a conference you went to, however you're learning UX, and then how you took those skills and put them into practice, even if it was just a project you did for yourself. What I would also encourage you to do is go find a real project, like, and, and it's easier than you think. Um, do you have someone in your family or a neighbor or someone you know who is a small business owner? Do they have a website? Is it a crappy website, <laughs> right? You've got a project right there waiting for you to do. Um, you don't have to charge them. You can just tell them, hey, what I'm getting out of this is experience and a portfolio piece. Um, I would encourage you to charge them something. That way they have skin in the game where you don't have to charge them a, a very large amount. Um, so those are some thoughts that, that come to mind when I think about what to put in your portfolio. Do put on that lens of the, the types of jobs you're applying to, the types of organizations you're applying to, what are they looking to see? And then what have you done that, that can convince them that you've got what it takes to do that job? Thank you for that. Um, another one that's come up a little bit, um, you know, multiple times is, is, you know, as a newbie designer, um, you know, maybe not new to the career field, but a career switcher or something like that. What are the pros and cons of a small design team versus a, you know, Amazon size design team that's global. If you have any opinion on that or, or things to things to keep in mind as you're kind of you know applying to these different types of jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's some good literature on this. There's a book out there. Um, uh, oh, now I know I would struggle to remember the title. It's um, something about being a team of one. Maybe someone will remember and put it in the chat. I think Leah Buley was the author of that one. Um, but yeah, so. I think when you're starting out in your career, you're probably best off joining a team because you can learn from others, right? Um, there are some rare individuals who will really excel as a team of one or as um, an independent freelancer. Um, but I, I know for me, the first 10 years of my career, I really benefited from being a part of, of kind of medium to large size teams where there were people with lots of experience. There we go. Um, Ali, thanks for that link. Uh, user experience, uh, team of one is the book I was thinking of. But um, yeah, then we can talk about different team size and, and structure too, right? So what are the total number of UX people in the team? You know, do you think you would just get lost if you were part of a team of 100 UX people spread across a dozen different divisions of an organization? Um, the flip side of that coin is there might be lots of career opportunity there. Certainly lots of opportunities to learn and, and um, you know, you'd have a rich community of other practitioners around you. And so, you know, think about what is that right size for you in terms of what you're comfortable with, um, in terms of career growth opportunities, networking opportunities, and so forth. Um, how that team is structured, I think, is also an interesting thing to think about. Um, there's broadly speaking kind of three ways UX can be organized within a company. A centralized group where the UX team all kind of sits together, so to speak. You have a UX director, manager, VP, whatever it is, who, who leads that group. And they offer their UX services to the rest of the organization, almost like an agency within the company. That's one way, that centralized model. The second way a UX team can be structured is um, a distributed model, a decentralized model, where maybe one or two designers or one or two researchers are embedded within product teams or divisions of the company. And there might be some sort of dotted line, like loose uh, cohesion in terms of a UX practice, but they report to people within product teams or lines of business. There's a third model. And, and if you read the book, Org Design for Design Orgs, which I'll recommend. In fact, I'm going to jump down to, I think I have that in the slide. There it is. Um, yeah, when I talk about corporate leadership, I brought this in. But this little, this little book down here in the, in the lower right, Org Design for Design Orgs, unpacks this third model, which they call a centralized partnership, uh, which is where you do have a centralized organization, but you sort of peel off small teams and embed them within product teams. You sort of get the best of both worlds. Um, I, I would kind of want to argue beyond a certain size. Once you have beyond, say, 10 or so UX people, um, what matters more than this, the number of people or the size of the team is actually the structure of the team and how it fits within the organization, interfaces within the rest of the organization. Those things are probably going to have a bigger impact on your career. 
Um, if you're decentralized, you may be stuck within just one corner of the company, one product or one division of the company and, and have a limited sort of experience because of who you report to. If you're in that centralized model, you might get to touch everything the company does. Um, and that may be a good or a bad thing depending on what you want, right? Another question that is, is kind of connected to, you know, where, where, the, where UX fits within the organization is in the UX or experience design team itself, can you talk a little bit about the difference between UX research, UX design, UI design, and maybe something like strategy, which in a lot of companies, you know, tends to be kind of a blurry line. Um, mm. So for people, you know, there's a few people in the chat here really interested in UX research versus UX UI design. Um, are any thoughts on, again, if, if research is really what you want to go for, how do you get there versus, you know, what we offer here at Design Lab, which is a more holistic view of, of the whole thing. Um, yeah, we'd, we'd love your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it's absolutely valid to specialize. Um, one thing to realize is if you decide, I just want to do research, I'm, I'm not much of a designer, I'm not very good at visualizing things, but I'm really good at gaining those insights from users and bringing those back to a, a team, um, you're going to be limiting your career opportunities because there are fewer of those positions out there. Having said that, they're out there, right? There are companies that hire researchers for dedicated research roles. And it can be really rewarding if that's what you want to specialize in and, and you get really good at it. Um, to, to sort of define the difference for anybody that might be confused about that, if you're purely doing UX research, um, you're, you're doing one of two things or, or both things. One would be generative research, where you're going out and gaining new insight into users, user behavior, their mental models, what will make things work better for people, right? And you're bringing that back to the organization sort of at the front end of the design process um, to inform the design process going forward. And there are all sorts of methods for, methods for doing that, qualitative methods and quantitative methods, right? You can, you can go do interviews is one of the most popular tactics. And I'm doing a lot of interviews right now in my job where I'm just going and getting qualitative insights from people, bringing those back to the organization. The other thing a researcher might do is actually help conduct usability tests. So they take the designs that a designer created and you put them in front of users and you observe. Um, and there are all sorts of ways to structure those tests. You can do it in a moderated fashion where you have sort of a script. You can do it uh, or, or you know, sort of an unmoderated fashion where you just sort of put the design in front of people and let them do what they're going to do. There are analytics tools that can help with that sort of thing. Uh, but the, the bottom line is you're getting qualitative and quantitative insights about user behavior, attitudes, emotions, and you're, you're synthesizing those into sort of summary. Here's what we know about the people we're trying to design for. That's what a researcher does. What the designer does, I think, is usually a little more obvious. You create the interface. You, you cast the vision, literally, visually, for what the interface looks like. Um, and of course, there are other senses you might design for as well, sound and, and tactile experiences and things of that nature. But usually, we're talking about visual design. Um, and so you're using design tools, your sketch, you know, Figma, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, all, all these sorts of tools to draw the thing. Um, again, I think it's totally valid to specialize in either one of those things or even more narrowly. Some people specialize in interaction design. Some people specialize in accessibility for UI design. Um, it's just the more you specialize, the fewer roles you'll find out there that companies are hiring for people who just do that one thing and nothing else. Um, back to you know the, the different types of organizations, startups, they can't afford to hire specialized UX people, right? They, they're too small of an organization and they don't have any money yet, except for investment funds. And so they, they need those generalists, right? Um, government, on the other hand, there are accessibility experts in government because it really, really, really matters that websites are accessible. Um, and so it just kind of depends on where you are, um, what, what type of specialization people are hiring for. Thank you. Um... I mean, we have tons of questions over here, but I don't know if there was an area of your presentation you wanted to kind of move on to at the moment, or uh, you know, I'm happy to kind of try and keep summarizing some of what I'm seeing. Well, um, let me take one more question, and then maybe I'll jump to another topic. 
Um, okay, so I guess you know one of the ones that that seems to be coming up a little bit is um, their backgrounds. So if you are a career switcher from education, healthcare, um, lawn, landscaping, hospitality. What are the key things that you as like a hiring manager, knowing, you know, if you're talking to this person, it's obvious they haven't been a designer for, you know, five years, but they do have some work experience. What are some key things that you would suggest they they try and and talk about in their, you know, in an interview or, you know, even if you're coming up with like a LinkedIn or about me page, um, how are they positioning themselves, um, you know, and standing out from the crowd if they are career switchers? Yeah, great question. Um, I think regardless of your background, if you have any kind of professional background or have done any sort of academic study, um, there is a way to pivot that into something that relates to UX. The, the reason I say that is because UX is such a broad, multidisciplinary field. There are so many different sub-disciplines. <laughs> it, it's funny, when you look at the history of UX, you'll get different stories from different people, right? Uh, some people will say, well, UX came out of computer science and, and human computer interaction. And that's where UX came from. Other people who, who maybe are researchers or have, and that's their bent will say, well, no, it comes out of psychology and sociology and understanding people, right? And then you've got people who think UX is, is just branding and visual design. Maybe, you know, people in, in marketing think that's UX is sort of like stepping on their toes, right? And, and it comes from that. And, and so when you look at it from that lens, like wherever you're coming from, right, there's, there's some aspect of UX that relates to that. So what I recommend to people is go to principles or, or kind of foundational things, right? Um, one of the most foundational things in UX is empathy, right? Human empathy, being able to build a sense of what it's like to be in someone else's shoes, to get those insights that help you feel what they're feeling or come as close as you can to that and then let that inform design. Um, if you build empathy with people <laughs> in your previous job um, or in how you studied things, highlight that, right? Talk about that. Um, certainly if, if there's any, any sort of creative work that you've done, and I don't just mean creative in the sense of like arts, but if you were crafting anything, putting, assembling anything, putting it together, bringing something into the world, um, there's a process behind that. And whether you realized it or not, that's a design process, right? And so you can break it down to what were the key parts of the process of, of creating whatever it was you created in your previous previous job or the thing that you studied and say, well, I can pivot that to UX because it's similar in these ways. So I, I think first you have to get underneath what are all the different kind of sub-disciplines within UX? And, uh, and there are many, <laughs> right? Um, and then relate what you've done in the past to that particular aspect of UX. And, and now you've got a story to tell that that sounds good, you know, in, in terms of being able to pivot to UX. Is okay. there, um, yeah, yeah, I guess one more for, for some of the, the people in the conversation now, could you, you know, again, in your opinion, which there are many, um, what do you think, or, or what would be the easiest way for you to explain, like, what is the difference between UX and UI? Um, oh, yeah. a lot of that <laughs> happening over there, and, and again, this is going to vary depending on you know your background your industry the company but um broadly it's, that is a very very old question but it's always <laughs> relevant always a relevant question um okay so ui design let's just be very literal and, and pick the letters apart and the words apart you are designing an interface that people use a user interface right what is a user interface right um it's it's the thing that you interact with to get a response, <laughs> right? I'm interfacing with a computer system. There's a screen, there's a keyboard, um, or it's a touch screen, or it's Alexa and I'm talking to her, right? Um, and so then it's a, a, a voice interface, right? The, the UI designer just thinks about that interaction, that human computer interaction, um, and tries to make that experience the best it can be for the human leveraging what the system can do. User experience is much broader. I'm, I'm very much of the mindset that um, these are not, it's not a Venn diagram where there's UI design and UX design and there's an overlap. That's not the right way to think about it. UX is the big circle and it fully encompasses UI design. <laughs> so I think UI design is actually a, a sub uh, discipline or a specialization of UX. That's the way I think of it. The things that 
fill that UX circle that are outside of UI design, right? Um, research. I mean, if we take it very literally, UI design, you can do that without any research. I wouldn't recommend it, but, but you can design something without doing research. So all that stuff I just said earlier about generative research and qualitative and quantitative, that's part of the UX practice. Um, you, you mentioned strategy earlier too, and I, I haven't really talked about it, but there's, there's a whole discipline and it's still very much emerging around UX strategy. And what does that mean at the product level to strategize for a great experience for a product, to strategize for a UX discipline within an organization, that's a, that's a career field that's emerging. Um, and those are all things that you, you don't necessarily even have to have UI design skills to do those things, but they're very much UX related. Um, I could go on and on, but I, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that at least serves as a partial answer there. Um, but I, yeah, fundamentally, UX is a much bigger set of concerns than UI design is what I would say. Okay, let's maybe jump to uh, one of the other topics here just for a minute. And um, let's talk about leadership. So there's a, a couple different things here, one in that corporate uh, column and then one in the, in the design discipline or design practice column. So in terms of the organization that you work for, um, you wanna think about the leaders you're going to be working for. And, and it can be hard sometimes on the outside looking in, right? If you're interviewing for a job, you may not feel comfortable asking a lot of questions about, you know, who are the people running the show here? Um, maybe until you get into those later rounds of interviews, it's certainly valid to do that then. Um, but how do those senior leaders of the organization exhibit human centeredness? What I mean by that is when you're hired there and you start working there as a UX practitioner, are you going to feel a lot of support top down for the kind of work that you're doing? Um, and I can contrast in my mind different environments I've been in. You know, on the one hand, uh, when I worked at Intuit, Intuit is a software company that, you know, if you've ever heard of TurboTax or QuickBooks, they make all kinds of financial software. And um, the founder of the company would come around to all the different campuses and participate in design reviews and would literally go out and lead field user research. He was that passionate about UX and it was fantastic to work in that kind of environment where the senior leaders of the company, and not just the founder, the CEO, everybody from the top down, they were all about UX. Um, I've worked in other environments where I don't think they could spell UX in the C-suite. It was just very, very different. And so that's something to look at. Um, does UX have a seat at that executive table? You know, Who is the, the highest ranking person in the organization? Who is a UX designer, or at least has some concept of what UX is and, and will advocate for it, right? Are you buried underneath layers of management or is there a leader that's high up in the organization? And then do senior leaders grant autonomy and delegate authority to designers when it comes to matters of design? Or you can replace that with the word research too, if you want, UX, right? Um, in some organizations, there's a, a battle going on, right? Between either say, you know, business leadership and UX, as I said earlier, sometimes in, in for-profit organizations, it can feel very much like, what the leadership wants to do for the good of the business isn't good for users, right? But do they grant autonomy to designers to make those decisions because it's it's right for the user? So those are some things to think about in terms of, of corporate leadership. When we talk about the UX practice, here are some good questions to ask. And I'm not gonna read all of these. I'll just, I'll just pick a few, right? Um, who has authority to make changes to the size and structure of the UX practice, right? Is there a UX leader whether they're a manager, director, VP, whatever level they're at, who can actually hire and fire UX people. Believe it or not, in many organizations, there, there isn't a UX practitioner making those decisions. It's a product leader, a marketing leader, a technology leader who's actually staffing the UX practice. That can make a big difference, right? Do they even know what to look for in terms of, of UX skills? Um, and, and, cha and changing the size and structure of the team too. If we decide, well, we're understaffed or you know, we're a little over-indexed in design, we need to hire some more researchers, that sort of thing. Who makes those decisions? Um, and then the last bullet there, um, are the UX leaders in the company, how are they viewed? What is their role? Is it just people management? Um, are they viewed as creative directors, right? Where they're the, the artsy ones who can make things look good, right? 
Um, or are they drivers of operational efficiency where they're really tied into the business strategy and the KPIs and the goals of the organization and, and they have a responsibility to um, help the organization make money, for example, or achieve their goals. There's different ways to look at leaders and, and it can really color the tone of what it looks like to work in that um, UX group, depending on how those leaders are viewed and, and what, what would the CEO say their job is, right? So those are just some, some things to think about. Any other questions that you see, Nicole, that you think are, are worth answering? Sure, sure. So we do have a lot of, you know, kind of recent grads, I think, here with us today, too. So in terms of figuring out, like, what is the right UX environment and should they start applying, are there any sort of, you know, when you talk more about, like, pick up a volunteer project, do something that you can at least practice design and figure out if, if this is the right direction for you. Are there any resources that you could um, suggest that they, you know, either go join or, or how might they find these things if it's not just sort of tapping your, your family member on the shoulder and saying, can I make you a website? Absolutely. Um, well, one easy thing that's free to do if as long as you can get people to give you some of their time is to do some research, right? I would go to your local UX meetup or just jump into a UX Slack community or discussion board or whatever and intentionally find people who work for different kinds of companies, different organizations and interview them. You know, go in with like a researcher with a set of, of a few questions, some of which I've, I've provided here to consider um, to, to get their perspective on what it's like in their context and then compare. You know, hey, I talked to this person at a big retail company. I talked to this person who is a UX designer at a university. Very different environments, and but asking the same questions. What did I hear, right? So that's one thing you can do. Um, you know, another thing you can try to do is um, sort of job shadow. I know that's not really a very common thing to do anymore, and certainly if you're not a student, it, it might seem really weird. <laughs> a lot of companies just, they're not going to let people in, right? Um, but ask, you know, hey, what is what is a day like for you at work? And in what form or fashion could I look over your shoulder while you do your work? Um, and, and you, you know, you may or may not be able to do that depending on who you're talking to. But again, at least turn it into an interview and, and get a sense of what they're doing. Um, you know, the other thing too is, like I said, just pursue those opportunities to do a project, um, even if you're volunteering your time, and be intentional about who you approach for that sort of thing. You know, if you have a passion for a certain industry vertical and a certain size of organization, you know, look at that intersection. Oh, I'm really, I love animals. I want to work with animals, maybe veterinary care, um, but I, I want to be a UX designer. And I, I would prefer to work for a mid-sized company that has some resources, but isn't huge, but isn't a startup. Okay. Is there a, a local branch of a large veterinarian hospital group? I don't know. I'm making this up, right? But can you, can you go and volunteer your time um, and your services as, as a UX designer there to redesign their mobile app, redesign their website, what have you? Those are, those are some good good ways to approach that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was speaking with one of um, our former students the other day, and she was part of a sailing group locally, and their website was not great. And so she took it upon herself to redesign their, you know, her community sailing. So again, like, you're probably already part of some of these organizations that you know that whatever they have is not the best. Um, you know, just try it out. And, you know, you, you probably know some of the people, too. Um, you know, on that, too, oh, one, yeah. one more quick thing on that that I'll share, I'll share it in the chat right now. Uh, I use Evernote to just capture things. And here's a link to my Evernote on resources for like pro bono projects, for volunteer projects. Um, and uh, you can you can hit some of these links and see if you can find something there. Yeah, thank you for that. That's amazing. <laughs> um, one more question kind of about roles. Uh, product designer versus UI UX designer. And again, this is very dependent on the company and sort of what they're doing, but do you have any any um, thoughts around why a company would title it one or the other or what the what the responsibilities might be that are different? I was literally having this conversation yesterday with one of my career services students. It comes up all the time because yeah, product designer is 
I think within, I don't know, the last five years maybe, has just exploded in popularity as a term, as a job title. Um, I'll give you my perspective on it. Um, I know if you talk to others, you'll, you'll get different perspectives. So, so please do that. But I would say um, a product designer is going to be asked to engage with product strategy um, in ways that maybe a UX designer wouldn't be asked to. Whether that's right or wrong is a different, <laughs> a different question. But when I hear product designer, I think, okay, you better be good at UX, but you also are gonna be asked to partner very closely with a product owner or a product manager whose job is to make sure that that product is successful for the organization. So the, the scope of your responsibilities and, and what you're focused on isn't just the user and what's right for the user, it's also how much money are we trying to make off this app or you know, what kind of conversion metrics are we looking at? What are the key performance indicators for the, the use of this digital channel, website, app, what have you? Um, and I'm responsible to help contribute to the success of what we're doing on the business side. Um, I, I don't think UX people should, should not do that. <laughs> right? I just think organizations have seen too many times UX designers that don't have any business sense and, and feel like, I'm supposed to focus on the user, you business people focus on the business. And, and I think maybe for a lot of organizations, that's where that job title comes from, is now we want a product designer, someone who will work with the product manager. Um, and it also may have to do with the rise of popularity of product manager as a role to digital product manager um, jobs have, have exploded in the last decade. And so it's a nice, pairing to have a product manager and a product designer <laughs> just from a job title standpoint. Thank you. But I, I certainly think there's a ton of overlap. Yes. Between yes. The two. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I think one of the other things to take away from this chat, as, as Ben has brought up, that there are a variety of opinions on all of this. So as much as we're very happy you're here, <laughs> please go out and, and talk to people and, and other designers and other leaders and sort of you know, friends, family, et cetera, who may have jobs in any sort of tech um, world. Um, so we have, you know, not so many minutes left here. Uh, ben, I don't know, you know, if there's anything else you want to touch on or or how you want to kind of um, finish up here. Yeah, you know, I'll go to that last column. When we talk about about you, and, and maybe this is a great way to end because we can get personal, right? Three things to think about when you're looking for your best fit. Um, what are my skills? The skills are the learned abilities that you've practiced and you can achieve high levels of performance. It's the things you've studied in school or taken a course or you've done on the job and you've built skill. Um, my advice with that is you know, periodically evaluate your top UX skills. There are actually tests and, and surveys and things you can take that can be helpful tools to help you understand what you're good at and, and where you have room to grow in terms of the UX skill sets. And just consider, when you're looking at job opportunities, are, are those skills actually going to be put to use? You know, based on what I see in the job description, based on what I'm hearing in maybe my first round interview, those things I'm already good at, am I going to actually be doing those day to day? The second thing to think about are your natural talents. And I'm making a distinction here. These are just innate abilities. You know, some people um, become great musicians and, and singers, particularly because they, they study and practice and practice and practice and practice and get a singing coach. Some people are just born with perfect pitch, right? Um, doesn't mean you don't still need to practice and build skill, but you have natural talent. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Um, my advice is try to gain an understanding of how you're uniquely wired. Um, asking other people is, is just a great quick way. What do you think I'm naturally good at, right? What do you see in me um, that just seems to come easily to me and ask, will I be able to do those things in this job? Um, again, going back to kind of designer versus researcher, right? You might have natural talent in visual design and visual communication. You, you still need to learn the skills, but some of those things may come easily to you. Um, on the other hand, you might have natural talent in synthesizing information from, from many voices. You could be an excellent researcher, right? Um, the third thing to think about is, is your passion, right? What do you love to do? What do you just do whenever you have time? <laughs> because you just want to do it. Looking for that alignment between what excites you and the organization or team you might join. That might come in at the level of, of sort of values of the organization. Um, that might come into play 
um, you know, just in terms of the, the mission of the, of the organization, what are they about? What are they trying to accomplish in the world? Um, different industry verticals will be more or less aligned to your passions. And so those are three things to think about. And, and I think it's useful to tease them apart and not lump them all together as one thing, but think about your skills, what you've learned to do, think about your talents, what you're just naturally inclined to do that you're good at, and then passions, the things that really get your blood pumping. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Um, you know, again, we just have a couple minutes here. Um, I, you, you know, if people have more specific questions, you can always reach up out to us at Design Lab at hello at trydesignlab.com. Talk to our support or admissions team. Um, you know, some of those questions get routed to me as, as the career person here. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's joined us today, and especially to Ben for sharing a little bit of insight into how do you find the right UX environment for you in this, you know, very wide world of design. Um, so again, thanks for joining us. This will be on our YouTube channel shortly um, and have a great day. Thank you.